Okay, good evening everyone. Today we're going to talk about a very important topic. And this topic has to do with what? With the heart, right? The heart. So the heart is important because it's what? The pump of the blood, right? It pumps blood to every single cell in your body. And, and the, the main reason that we need to cover this topic today is because of the fact that the number one cause of death in the United States and in the world is what? Heart disease, right? So apparently, what are the chances of this topic and diseases that will appear in the nursing board exam? High or very high? Very, very high. high, okay? So, let's review the heart and the uh, coarse body blood vessels. The heart is found behind what? The sternum, right? And if everybody make a fist, this approximately the size of your heart. The heart is found behind the chest, behind what or bone? The sternum, right? And it happens to be apparently right behind what part of the sternum? The manubrium, the body, or the siphon process? Body. The body of the sternum. That's precisely the reason why when the patient goes into cardiac arrest, where do you put the heel of the palm of the hand? The On the body of the sternum, right? With the elbow straight, and you have to what? Pump, right? Chest compression is done on the body of the sternum because for obvious reason, the heart is found underneath the sternum, right? So again, you have how important is anatomy? Very important. It's the foundation of nursing and medicine, okay? So when do we pump or when do we do chest compression when the heart stops pumping blood? When you go into cardiac arrest, it stops pumping blood. Now, let's review the anatomy of the heart. How many chambers does the heart have? Four. Four. Right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and what's the other one? <coughs> so you have here the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, the left ventricle. Now what brings blood to the right atrium? Superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Now, why are they blue? Okay, they bring blood that is rich in carbon dioxide. All the veins in the head, the neck, and the upper limbs, where do they go? Superior vena cava. What about the veins in the feet, the leg, and the thigh, and organs below the heart? Very good. Okay, so all of them are blue. Blood vessels because they carry blood rich in carbon dioxide. They enter the right atrium from both superior and inferior vena cava. And then they pass to what valve? What is the valve on the right side of the heart? Tricuspid. Tricuspid valve. Tricuspid means it has three cusps. And then it goes into the next chamber, which happens to be what? The right ventricle. Okay? And from the right ventricle, where does the blood go? What is the name of the valve here? It's called the pulmonary valve or pulmonary semilunar valve. It goes to what blood vessel? Pulmonary trunk and then goes to where? Pulmonary what? Arteries. How many do we have? Two. Left and right. Okay. And then what happens in the lung? Exchange of gases takes place between the pulmonary capillaries, which is a blood vessel, which contains a red blood cell. And of course, what? The air sac or what we call alveolus. The carbon dioxide diffuses from an area of high concentration to what? To low. So in other words, the red blood cell carries the CO2, it enters the air sac, and the air sac goes to the airway from the bronchioles, tertiary bronchi, secondary bronchi, primary bronchi, then the trachea, the larynx, and the pharynx, and then what? out when you exhale through the nose, right? Why do we exhale the carbon dioxide? Because it is considered what? Waste. Waste. We do not need carbon dioxide. Who needs the carbon dioxide? Plants. The plants. What do we get from the plants in return through photosynthesis? Oxygen. So the air contains oxygen. We inhale. Oxygen goes into the nose, or you can breathe through the mouth. Then the pharynx, larynx, trachea, primary bronchus, secondary bronchus, tertiary bronchus, bronchioles, then eventually where? 
to the air sac. And now the diffusion again, like reverse diffusion will take place. This time, the oxygen in the air, air sac goes where? To the pulmonary capillaries, which contains the blood, which contains the red blood cell. So who now becomes the new passenger of the red bus, which I call red blood cell? Oxygen, okay? So now the oxygen is now in the red blood cell attached to the hemoglobin in the iron, in the porphyrin ring. Eventually, it transported to what blood vessel? Away from the lung. Pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins. How many do we have? One, two, one, two. Total of? How many from the right lung? Two. How many from the left lung? Two. Two, two plus two gives you how many pulmonary veins? Okay, what about pulmonary arteries? So why do you think the pulmonary veins are red or brownish red? Because obviously they carry what kind of blood? And where do the pulmonary veins bring the blood to? What chamber of the heart? Left atrium. And then the blood passes to what valve? Mitral valve or bicuspid valve then eventually where? Into the left ventricle. And then from the left ventricle when the ventricular muscle contracts, it goes where? Aortic what? The valve. Aortic semilunar valve and goes where? Into the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, descending aorta, thoracic aorta, pierces the diaphragm, you have the abdominal aorta. Now can anybody tell me this? What is this blood vessel here? This is called the brachiocephalic artery. What about this one here? Left common carotid. What about the one here? Now believe me, you should know all this thing, believe me, okay? On the right side, there is a break of cephalic. On the left side, there is none. That's the reason why the left common carotid comes directly from the aorta, and the left subclavian comes directly from where? To the aorta too. On the other hand, what about the right common carotid and the right subclavian? They come from where? Brachiocephalic, so they branch out into two. And you know the subclavian, sub means below the clavicle. Here they become what? What happens to the subclavian? It changes name. It becomes axillary artery, because it's now in the axilla or armpit. And then what happens in the arm? Brachial. What's another word for brachial? Arm. And then, isn't it amazing? Don't you love anatomy? If the artery is found in the axilla, what is the name? <coughs> axillary artery. If the artery is found underneath the clavicle, what is the name? Subclavian. From the word sub, which means below, clav means clavicle. Don't you love anatomy? It's very descriptive. Any student from elementary high school should understand because brachial means arm and axillary means armpit. Of course, maybe high school, not elementary unless that is a gifted child, right? Okay? Do you understand? And then when I say get the blood pressure of the patient, what is the name of the artery here in the arm? So everybody palpate your brachial artery pulse. Now I can tell right away if it's right or wrong by looking at your fingers. Okay? Okay, so can you feel your pulse? Okay, let me see my, my beautiful pulse. So ideally, remove anything that's covering it, your clothes, and then it's somewhere near the middle, medial aspect. Oh my gosh, it is so bounding and powerful because I am alive. <laughs> if I have no pulse, I am dead. I don't breathe, there is no pulse, unconscious. That's the reason why you do the CPR, right? You understand? Now, let's review the purpose of the valves. Why do we need valves, class? Mm -hmm. Yes? Prevent backflow. What else? To make the blood flow in one. Isn't that a bad one direction? <laughs> so, when the blood goes to the atrium on the right and the atrium on the left, what happens? They have to go where? To the right and left ventricle at the same time. Right? Let's see if you can remember these. So when we took anatomy for a few semesters ago or terms ago, let's have the heart here. The best way to learn is use a whiteboard. How many of you have whiteboards at home? 
Okay, if you have none, you are doomed. Okay? <laughs> what separates the right side from the left side? The septum. So why am I recommending using a whiteboard? Because if you do what I do here, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, do what I do, and hopefully you get a perfect score in the quiz, right? Okay. This is called the right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, left atrium, bicuspid valve or mitral valve, the other name, and left ventricle. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And then in for in order to just know the flow of blood in the heart, let's review the flow. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. Here, the blood came from the veins of what? Head, neck, and upper what? Limbs. On the other hand, inferior vena cava, the blood came from what? The veins of the what? Thoraco, lower thoracic, abdominal, pelvic, and lower what? Limbs. All the veins there. So it's like a 405 north and 405 south freeway. Okay? All the veins, you carry blood, the leg veins, the venous veins, side femoral veins, and then they join in the common iliac veins to become what? The inferior vena cava, which enters the right atrium. Now, normally, in our heart, the pulmonary trunk goes up from the right ventricle like this, right? Okay? So, but for all intents and purposes, so that you just know how the blood will flow, I'll just, I'll just put it down here. So the pulmonary trunk divides into what? Right and left what? Pulmonary artery. So how many pulmonary arteries do we have? Two. Two. And it goes where? Through the lung. And what happens in the lung? Get rid of CO2, and what do you bring in? And how does the blood go back to the left atrium of the heart? Via what? And how many do we have? Four. Two from the left, and two from where? The right lung. You have taken anatomy, you have taken physiology, this is material that you should really be able to know by heart, actually by brain, particularly the long-term memory portion called the hippocampus. Any nursing student or medical student, if he cannot or she cannot even know this, it's gonna be hard, you'll be struggling. It's very basic. You should be able to do what I do, okay? Now, the blood flows from the lung to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins, passes through the bicuspid or mitral valve, passes to the left ventricle, then gets out from what? Aortic, semilunar valve, I forgot to mention the pulmonary semilunar valve here. And then what is this blood vessel here? Aorta. And where does the aorta bring the blood? To all the arteries, to all the organs, right? So let me just simplify this. If this is the heart, this is the left ventricle, this is the aorta. I, I made it like this so that you know how the blood will flow. But in reality, it goes like this, right? Ascending, arch, descending aorta. You have the right brachiocephalic, right B, and then what? Left common carotid, and then what is this? Left subclavian, left subclavian which becomes what? axillary which becomes what brachial. brachial and becomes what radial and ulnar that's why you have your radial pulse which is near the radius and the ulnar near the ulna okay so every time you need to know this now this is also seen on the right the brachycephalic divides into two Right common carotid, and this is called what? Right subclavian, the same thing will happen. Axillary, and then becomes brachial, depending on where it's located. But it's the name, just name the changes, but it's actually the same artery. Do you understand? Okay? Now, as it goes to the diaphragm here, okay, it divides into two, in the pelvic area, into the right and left common iliac. And the common iliac divides into what? 
external iliac, and then what? Internal iliac. Why iliac? Because it's in the area where you have the iliac bones. Here, remember iliac bones? The external iliac goes down to become what? Femoral artery. The femoral artery traverses to the femur in the thigh, particularly the adductor magnus muscle. And then what happens in back of the knee? The femoral becomes what? Popliteal. What does popliteal mean? Behind the art knee. And then the popliteal divides into two. What are these two? Tibial and fibular arteries. Do you understand? Is that clear? And then, of course, the fibular part of that becomes the dorsalis pedis artery. What's the name of the artery? Dorsalis pedis. Dorsal meat on top of your foot. So if I tell the nurse, nurse palpate for the dorsalis pedis pulse or pedal pulses, you are supposed to put your two fingers where? Check for the pulse of the foot, especially if there's if you want to know if there's adequate blood flow. Is that clear? Okay, everybody follow me. Okay, let's see if you can know. Palpate your right radial pulse. Okay, you're holding the left, my goodness. <laughs> Nurses, you should learn to follow what? Instructions. If you don't follow instructions, what happens during the nursing board exam? You'll be in trouble. So right radial pulse. Now what about the left brachial artery pulse? What about the right? Okay. What about the common carotid pulse? The right and the left. What about the femoral pulse? Femur, inguinal area. What about the popliteal pulse at the back of your and then the dorsalis pedis pulse, P-E-D-I-S, on top of what? Of the foot, okay? In the nursing board exam, they will show you a picture of the body and they will ask you. The doctor requested you to check for the pedal pulses. Are you gonna put your answer here? What do, what do you think will the computer say? It's a computerized test. This will make a terrible nurse. I do not want this nurse to pass this exam. If only the computer would speak. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just trying to be exaggerated, but that's exactly what happens, okay? The bottom line is that we want perfection here, no mistakes. If I want to check for the brachial pulse, the brachial pulse is here. Brachial means arm, do you understand? Now, in the heart, we said we have four chambers. The walls of the heart, what is found in the wall of the heart? What are the layers there? Endocardium, which is this one which I'm touching here. And then what is the thickest layer? Myocardium. The myocardium, which is the cardiac muscle cells. And then what's the outer layer? Epicardium. epicardium. Correct? Now, what's another name for epicardium? Yes? Which one? Visceral or parietal? It's the visceral pericardium. And then you have the parietal pericardium. It's part of the serous membrane. Remember, serous membrane, pleura for the lung, pericardium for the heart. What do you call the space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium? Hmm? What? Pericardial sac. Well, the entire thing is the sac. I'm, oh, I'm, my question is very specific. What do you call the name of that pericardial space? Um, pericardial cavity, of course, what else would it be? And what is inside the pericardial cavity? And what is the name of the fluid? What is it? Don't you love anatomy? What's the name of the space? Pericardial cavity. What's the name of the fluid? Pericardial fluid. Is the pericardial fluid an example of a serous membrane fluid? Yeah. Yes, because the pericardium is a serous membrane. And what is the purpose of the pericardial fluid there? Cushioning of the lubrication. <laughs> okay, cushioning or lubrication? Lubrication. In medicine, we want exact words. What is the proper word that we would like to accept? 
lubrication, your natural KY. <laughs> why do people always laugh about KY? <laughs> you always think about sex and dryness of the vagina. Well, in this case, we want to make sure that every time the heart pumps blood, do you want the pericardial space or cavity to be dry? No. Can you imagine every time the heart pumps blood, you'll have pain, oops, ouch, ouch, ouch. No. So thank you in behalf of humanity, thank you pericardial fluid, you made my day, okay? In other words, the pericardial fluid is a lubricating jelly or fluid, which is designed as a lubricant, similar to KY, which reduces the friction so that there will be no pain. In other words, it's not enough to know the answer, but to know why. Why do we need the pericardial fluid there? Just like in the lung, the pleural fluid was going to reduce the friction and therefore allows it to breathe in and out without any pain. Now, what happens if there's excessive amount of pericardial fluid? Is that good for the heart? No, no. Bad for the heart, because what will it do to the heart? It co constricts or compresses the heart. What do you call the term when there is pericarditis and there's excessive amount of pericardial fluid? To some extent, that could be cardiac tamponade. There's a specific term we use called pericardial effusion. E-F-F-U-S-I-O-N. It's like in the lung, pleural, pleural effusion. Two things is possible reason for that. The most common is infection like pericarditis, or there could be spread of tumor and malignant cells. Is that very common in the heart, most likely in the lung, right? Pleural effusion in the lung, pericardial effusion here. Now, what exactly is cardiac tamponade? Accumulation, Accumulation of what? Fluid, and in some cases could be what? It's blood fluid. Yes. yes, how many of you have been shot in the past in the chest? Okay, <laughs> nobody, good for you. Let's pretend I was shot, I was hit by the bullet, and there is bleeding inside the pericardial cavity. Can that be considered pericardial? Tamponade, cardiac tamponade? Yes, will that kill me? Yes. Of course because it will restrict the pumping action of the heart. The heart will be compressed, right? Now, if I put the stethoscope here and try to listen for the heart sounds, would I be able to hear the heart sounds? Lub dub, lub dub, or dig dig. How would you describe the heart sounds in a patient with cardiac tamponade? Who said muffled? Who said muffled? Mr. Ruiz, is your answer correct? Am I smiling? <laughs> Am I using my zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor for smiling? <laughs> Innervated by the facial nerve? Like the joker? <laughs> I'm not joking, it's, you are absolutely right. Now, why will it be muffled, see? The answer is correct, but you notice what I always ask students? Why, how, where, and when? So explain to us, why would it be muffled? Mm -hmm. Is that the reason why? Huh? The what? The rubbing, okay. It's okay, I, I will accept any answer that you have. <laughs> but I will smile whenever the answer is correct. I hope you don't mind. It's not designed to humiliate you or make you look dumb or stupid, but I will accept. This is a free country, democratic. Okay, why would it be muffled? Huh? Yes! Where's the fluid found? What part of the pericardium? The membrane or the cavity? cavity? So please be specific. Dr. Gamma, the answer is very easy. If I were you in your shoes, I would say, the presence of the fluid or the blood in the periocardial cavity, it occupies space. And the moment it occupies space, look. If this were my heart, and I put my stethoscope here, and I will listen to my own heart sounds, now, by the way, what creates the heart sounds? The contractions of the um, 
Am I smiling? There are two heart sounds that are normal. S1, S2. First heart sound. Yes? What happened to them? They close. In other words, closure of the tricuspid and bicuspid valve produces the first heart sound. Lub, L-U-B, or dig. This is what the books would say. This is dub, this is lub, but mine is unique. Tig, dig, tig, dig, tig, dig. And this one is what? So this is tricuspid, and then what? Bicuspid, what about the second heart sound? Oh my gosh. Pulmonary, semilunar valve, and then what? Aortic. Aortic valve. So the sound is produced when they open or when they close? close. When they open or they close? close. When they close or they close? <laughs> so funny, huh? Okay. Let's pretend. I put the stethoscope. This is what you're supposed to hear. Tick, dig, tick, dig. Tick, dig, tick, dig, tick, dig, tick, dig. What happens now if there is the presence of what? Fluid or pericardial, excessive pericardial fluid or blood. When you have a gunshot wound or stab wound, how many of you Nobody has been stabbed, right? Okay. So, see the difference. What do you call that heart sound? What do you call that heart sound? Muffled or waffled? <laughs> What's the difference? The, the idea here is this. You're about to take the nursing board exam. You see the word muffled heart sound. Bang! Answer, cardiac tamponade. Hi, my name is Muffled Heart Sound. What would you say? What's your name? Tamponade, see? The idea here is that you as a student must think fast, act fast, answer fast, because you're only given 90 seconds for every question in the nursing board exam. I did my calculation, I'm very good in math. And every student who takes the nursing board exam has 265 questions given in six hours times 60, that would be 360 minutes. And every minute is 60 seconds. Based on my calculation, you're only given 90 seconds. What does it mean? You have to be very smart. And I know you're all smart, because all of you want to get an A in this class. So muffled heart sounds, cardiac tamponade. Now, what do you think Dr. Gamal will do in this patient? Uh, the, we already have much to discuss the topic, right? Remove the fluid. How? Uh, what do you think Dr. Gamal will do? Uh, hmm? I will do what? OK, what's the term used? Because you involve the pericardial cavity, there's excessive blood or fluid there. You perform what we call a pericardial synthesis. Pericardio, C E N T E S I S. And what do I need, nurses? A syringe. A syringe and a. That should be what? Clean or sterile? sterile. sterile. Are you going to provide me ga a gown? No. Well, technically, you should because. Sterile environment, right? Yes. What about sterile gloves? Yes. Are you doing going to be wearing the same thing? Yes. Okay, we're now in turn, enter, entering the pericardial cavity. You do not want to contaminate and add more organism there. If it's pericardial effusion secondary to pericarditis, do you understand? Okay. And what do you do with the specimen? Send it to the lab. Culture and sensitivity testing because you can be able to grow an organism like bacteria. And if it's malignancy, sent for histopathology for possible cancer cells. Okay, now, so the idea, therefore, is that we talked about the chambers of the heart, the myocardium. Very easy. If the myocardium is inflamed, it's called myocarditis. If it's the endocardium, it's endocarditis, right? Either bacterial or viral. So be careful of the viruses. Just don't take it for granted, right? Okay? Now, with regards to um, what else? Now, what causes the muscles to contract? 
Yes? The pacemaker is of the heart. What is the primary pacemaker of the heart? S A Huh? S A N O or A V N O? Huh? S A N O. Okay, I said okay. So remember, the S A N O is here, sends a signal to the left and the right, what? At the same time. What kind of signal? Electrical signal or impulse? It goes to the muscles or the myocardium. What does it do to the myocardium? Makes it contract. Uh, the people at the back, are you listening to me? Can you hear me? Yes, or are you busy looking at your cell phones or what? Okay. Please look at me. I don't want you to suffer. Are you sure you can hear me? Are you, are you sure you can see me? I doubt. I'm going to cut my hair if you can see this thing that I wrote here. Believe me. So I would suggest you come forward. Right? But it's up to you. This is a free country. But my only concern are the people at the back because I'm pretty sure you cannot see. I'm, I'm a medical doctor, so I can tell by the distance alone if you can see all of this clearly. Okay. Yes, my friend. Can you see? Okay. I will point to something and tell me what it is. Because she says, she said, she said, right? Okay. What is this? Huh? Okay. Very good. Okay. What about this one? I know. I'm just trying to find out. <laughs> we can't even see. If we can see, that means there's something wrong, right? <laughs> yes. We can't see. Okay. Now, I'm just, honestly speaking, I don't think you can see. Okay? <laughs> Unless you have what? Zoom lens, you know? Okay, anyway, it's up to you, okay? Anyway, so it's important to know this thing. Now, when the SA node sends a signal here, it what? What is atrial systole? Muscles contract at the same time, bang, the valves open, what happens? If this is in systole, this must be what? Diastole. The valve is closed, the valve is closed, this will open, why? The blood will flow. So when the blood is flowing, this is closed, this is closed, open, open. The moment it gets filled, guess what happens? It is so precise. As the blood is flowing, the electrical impulse is also going down at exactly the same time. From the SA node, AV node, bundle of what? His right bundle branch, left bundle branch, Perkinji fibers, Perkinji fibers. What will the Perkinji fibers do to the left ventricular and the right ventricular muscles? Stimulate them to contract. Why? Because once it gets filled with blood, this will close. That creates the first heart sound. This will contract. This will go to the lung. This will go to the aorta. At the same time. Same. Amazing. Where can you find an organ that is so precise? Only here. So, this goes to the lung, this goes to the aorta, so this has to open. Right? Do you understand? Now, as, as this is happening here, guess what? The blood is going here. This will close, remember we said it closes, and this is opens, and then once it gets out, this will close. Now when this closes, that produces your what? Second heart sound, do you understand? Do you understand? Okay, do you understand? Is that clear? So what do you call when muscles contract? Systole. If this is an atrial systole, this must be what? Ventricular diastole at the same time. When this is ventricular systole, what happens here? Atrial what? Diastole. Always the opposite. Systole or contraction, relaxation or diastole. When this is in contraction or systole, this must be what? Why would it be relaxed? So that it can what? Accept the blood, but this has to be closed to be able to accept the blood. Amazing. Do you understand? Okay? 
Now, because we're now talking about the pacemakers and the effect on muscle contraction, let's talk about what? Electrocardiogram. It's part of the study guide, right? Now, I'm going to sing a song. I, did I sing a song in my anatomy class? Do you remember the song? The alphabet song? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, B, Q, R, S, T, U, and me. We're gonna study the E, C, G. Boys and girls, come sing with me. Let us learn the ECG. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so this is the P wave, QRS, and this is what? The T wave, okay? When you become future nurses, are you going to see electrocardiograms every day of your life? Yeah. If you happen to be working in the intensive care unit, yes, you will. And that's where most of the money comes from. Who gets paid more? A nurse working in the ICU or working in the nursing home? ICU. Of course. Why would I pay more money to that woman that will just give medications and get the vital signs? I would rather give somebody more money because they're working in the intensive care unit. Okay? I remember the first time I went into the intensive care unit in the hospital I trained. I looked like a stupid student because I did not know anything. Who, who knew more than I do? The nurses. So that I befriended all the nurses in that ICU. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were so nice to me. I was nice to them. I always what? I used my zygomaticus major and minor. I remember one time at two in the morning, the nurse said, Dr. Gamma, would you like to sleep for 30 minutes? It's like gold, you know, when you are able to sleep during the night when you're on duty. And then you sleep, you wake up, you feel refreshed. See? Because we were nice to the nurses. Okay, now, what about this one? What is the meaning of the P wave? QRS and the T wave. Now remember, class, what will be first? The electrical event or the mechanical event? Electrical. Of course, electrical event. Followed by what? The mechanical. the mechanical event. Now, I am pretty sure those people at the back can't really see this because my handwriting is very small, so. <laughs> the P wave is known as what? Atrial what? Depolarization. depolarization. What is depolarization? Electrical stimulation. It goes to the right atrium and the left atrium what? From the SA node at the same time. What will be the effect on the atrial muscles? Atrial what? What is another word for contraction? Systole. In other words, the right and the left atrium will contract. And when they contract, bam! The valves will open, the blood will flow to the ventricular chambers at the same time. This has to close, this has to close. This has to open to let the blood flow. If this is contracting, this must be what? Relaxed, which is common sense. You cannot have one contracting and contracting at the same time. The blood will not flow at all. <coughs> From a high pressure gradient to a lower pressure gradient. Now what about QRS? Okay. Ventricular what? Ventricular. Depolarization, which leads to what? Ventricular contraction or systole. And what about the T wave? Represents what? Ventricular repolarization, which leads to what? Ventricular what? Diastole. Do you understand? Is that clear? Okay. Okay. So the first one, the P wave. Atrial depolarization or electrical stimulation leading to what? Atrial systole? Which is contraction. Is contraction? What about the QRX complex? Ventricular, Ventricular what? D, as in dog. Depolarization leading to what? 
ventricular systole, every time it depolarizes the muscle, it makes it contract or systole. On the other hand, what about the T wave? Okay, ventricular repolarization, which basically is what? The muscles will relax. It's called ventricular diastole. Do you understand? Now, why do you think, which do you think is the higher blood pressure? We say 120 over, over 80. 120 is systolic blood pressure. What about the 80? Why? Because in systolic pressure, the heart is what? Pumping blood. It goes where? To the aorta and then what? To the brachial artery. That's the reason why it's high. What about diastole? The DBP or diastolic blood pressure, which is the 180, 120 over 80, which means what? The left ventricular muscles are relaxed. The reason why the pressure is lower, which makes sense. You learn all of these where? Anatomy and physiology. You understand? Okay? Now, so we're just trying to review anatomy and physiology here. Okay. The question now is, and I will go back to this. I'm just going to mention because I'm talking about the electrocardiogram already here. So I don't have to go back to this. You notice how important the electrocardiogram is? So this is actually like this. Chick jig, chick jig, chick jig, chick jig. Notice the distance between one Q. RS complex to the next is equidistant. That is what? Normal sinus rhythm. Or regular normal sinus rhythm from the word what? Sinoatrial node. What is it called? Regular or normal sinus rhythm. What is normal heart rate? Between 80 to one, 80 or 60? 60. 60. 60 to 100. What about if it's below 60? So if it's 59, what about if it's 60? Very good. What about 100? 101. Tachycardic. Okay. So the bottom line, therefore, is when you look at the electrocardiogram, this one is this one. Do you understand? Now, you've probably read about what is an arrhythmia? A without what? Regular sinus rhythm. A means without rhythm or irregular rhythm. For example, My goodness, <laughs> all my keys fell. So what do you think happened here? <laughs> what happened? The patient went into a, had a flat line. Yes. First, ventricular fibrillation means heart is quivering, it's no longer an effective pump, and then suddenly what well, stops pumping because it's flatline. Flatline means there is no electrical activity, and when there is no electrical activity, there will be no what? Mechanical activity. In other words, the flatline leads to a cardiac arrest, which means there is no electrical stimulation, or depolarization of the muscles of the heart. The heart goes into cardiac standstill or cardiac arrest, you're dead. And what do we do? What do I ask the nurse to provide me with? A defibrillator. We have one here, a simple one. It's called AED. Does anybody know what AED stands for? Hmm? What? Automatic or automated? 
Now let me check. Is it still? Have they changed it to automatic or automated? Huh? Can you do me a favor? Can you check for me, please? It would be very embarrassing. We are a nursing school and we still put automatic there. I already told their attention to the Miriam Kahan. I said, Miss Miriam, that is to be automated. So let's see. So what is the correct answer? Automated, automated external defibrillator. And in the hospital, we use the bigger one, right? Right? So when you have a flat line, there is no pulse, the patient is not breathing. What does it say? Automated. Oh, it really changed it. Good, thank God. <laughs> Two, three years ago, it was still automatic. And I told them, it has to be automated. Can you imagine if you have visitors to our school and they say the word automatic? I will not study here anymore. <laughs> they don't know how to spell automated. Okay. Okay, now, so stand clear, I'm clear, everybody clear. Stand clear, everybody clear. Stand clear, everybody clear. No response after 30 minutes of continuous CPR. I pronounced patient dead at exactly 6.55 p.m. April 20, what is day today? For the West Coast Medical Center. May he rest in peace. <laughs> Do you understand? Okay? So the bottom line, therefore, is we need to know all these things uh, as we go into the different conditions later on. Right? I I'm just trying to give you an idea of what is normal anatomy and physiology so that you will know. Now, this will not come out in the, nurse, uh, in the quiz today, but this will be important for... Remember the valves? We use a stethoscope to listen to the function of the valves. What do you call this part of the stethoscope that goes into the ear? called the air piece. <laughs> I really love anatomy. <laughs> what is this called? The air piece. They have two, left and right. Before you, you check, you don't say, mic, that thing, mic, no. You touch gently and then listen to the sound created. So this is the simple one. One that has the diaphragm and the bell. If you are a the Littman is one of the best, or you have the Rappaport type of stethoscopes. You have a diaphragm and you have a bell. Here it's only a diaphragm. Like a dia no, drum. Okay. So, I want you to write this down. This might come out in the midterm or the finals, but midterm or finals. Okay. If you want to listen to the aortic valve. Write this down. The aortic valve can be auscultated. Auscultate means to listen with the use of a stethoscope. You know what's auscultation? A-U-S-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-O-N is auscultation. The use of the stethoscope to listen to the sound. Now, it's just, aortic valve is found on the right. Second, intercostal space. What do you mean by intercostal space? The space between the ribs. Okay, the first rib is here. The second rib is there. The space between the first and the second rib is called first intercostal space. The answer would be where? Second intercostal space, or ICS, right parasternal border. So second intercostal space, right Parasternal border. You know how to spell parasternal? Para means, P-A-R-A -A means on the side of the sternum, over here. And what is the valve that you can be able to auscultate there? Aortic. Aortic valve. Now what about the pulmonic valve? The same thing, second intercostal space, but this time left parasternal border. That's the pulmonary valve. The pulmonary valve is second intercostal space, left parasternal board. What does parasternal mean? Beside the sternum. Now what about the tricuspid valve? So fifth intercostal space. One, two, three, four, five. So the tricuspid valve, left, fifth intercostal space, left, Parasternal border. Left parasternal border. 
Now make a note, in some references, it could be on the right. But for Dr. Gamos' exam, left parasternal border. Now what about the marital valve? Now you see the clavicle here? See the clavicle? Okay. The marital valve is, the answer is this. First space, second, third, fourth, fifth. Fifth intercostal space, left mid clavicular line. Fifth intercostal space, where? Left mid clavicular line. Fifth intercostal space, left mid clavicular line. So all otherwise in shortcut, it is LMCL. L-M-C-L, capital L, capital M, capital C, capital L, L-M-C-L. Yes, ma'am? Marital valve. So, notice three of them are on the left side. Which one is on the right side of the sternum? Only the aortic valve. The pulmonary valve, the tricuspid valve, and the marital valve are all on the left side in relation to the sternum. But which one uses the midclavicular line used? Okay. Now, aside from, remember I said fifth intercostal space for the left midclavicular line for the mitral valve, put a comma there also for what? Apical pulse. Apical pulse. So for the mitral valve, that is the same area for what? Apical pulse of the heart. What is the apex of the heart? The bottom portion of the heart. Still the same. So left midclavicular line, LMCL, is also not only to listen with the use of a stethoscope for what? The mitral valve, but at the same time what? Apical pulse. And I'll tell you why later on we'll talk about the giving of uh, digitalis medication for heart failure patients. Now the other thing you need to remember too is this. With regards to, uh, so it's mitral valve, apical pulse. The third word you put there is PMI. Does anybody know what PMI stands for? For those who are LVNs, you should know the answer to this question. So the apical pulse and the mitral valve location is the same as that of the PMI. What does PMI mean? Yes? Anybody? You're an LVN, right? Who else is an LVN here? I think you're an LVN. You say LVN? Yes. What is, it? What is PMI? Same thing, but it's with fire. That's PSI. <laughs> Not PMI. Okay, let me answer my own question. It's called the point of maximal impulse. Remember, why did you not answer? I don't know why, right? Point of maximal impulse. Now, you might be wondering, Dr. Gamo, I'm already overwhelmed, that's life. Because in the nursing board exam, sky's the limit when it comes to the questions. There's be a lot of questions for you. Okay, do you understand? Okay, so I did that, I covered that, the heart and the anatomy of the heart. Now, in the cardiac function of the heart, it's very easy. If it's infection, endocarditis, myocarditis, I don't have to go into the details. Obviously, there is fever. It affects the heart, right? Uh, what is rheumatic heart disease? It involves what? Mm -hmm. What usually precedes a rheumatic heart disease condition? Rheumatic fever, which involves what? Streptococcal infection of the throat. Remember the hypersensitivity? Remember, what is that? Type what? We just had a quiz a few weeks ago, and they really forget. Type one, type two, type three, or four? Three. three. <laughs> Remember? Okay. Now, in other words, you develop antibodies against what? The strep, but also affect what? The heart. Just like, remember, the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, right? Okay. So it involves the valves. You have what? Valvular diseases. That's why, normally, remember, the heart sound would be like this, right? Jig, jig. To jig. When the valves are destroyed, you need to put the stethoscope on the location I told you to do, right? Remember? The spaces, intercostal spaces, and say, 
Oh, the patient has tricuspid tri tri valve regurgitation. So what do you put your stethoscope? Fifth intercostal space, left mid, uh, left power sternal border, right? Left, did I say that? Left power sternal border. So all three are power sternal, the only one that's mid clavicular would be what? The marital valve. And you will hear something like this. Is that a hard mar heart murmur? It's called the cardiac murmur. That means there's something wrong with the valves. Okay? Now, let's deal first. For me, the, there are two problems here in the heart. Number one is ischemic heart disease and MI. Which one is more life-threatening? So ischemic heart disease, as we know, is due to what? If this is the aorta here, you have the right and the left coronary arteries, right? The coronary arteries are filled with fat deposit called atherosclerosis. We learned this last time, right? It's called plaque. As the plaque develops, what happens to the blood flow? Less or more? Less. Less. It's called ischemic. It's not dead yet, but it's decreased blood. Would that lead to angina? Yes. Okay. And what is the type of angina that is triggered by exercise and relieved by rest? Stable. 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 And what about if it's not relieved by rest? Unstable. Now what about that angina that has nothing to do with fat deposit, but it's because of coronary artery vasus spasm? Prince the singer. I'm just kidding. Prince metal. So what is the problem in Prince metal angina? When you say coronary artery vasus spasm, what happened there? What muscles? Huh? Does anybody know? When you say vasus spasm, there is spasm of the muscles. Where is the muscle found? Huh? Of course, the artery. Coronary artery vasus spasm. What kind of muscle do you find in the tunica media? Smooth or smooth? Can we afford to forget our anatomy? Please don't forget that. So what happens if the coronary artery tunica media smooth muscle contract? This leads to vaso what? Spasm, muscle spasm, muscle spasm, vasoconstriction. What happens to the blood flow? Less. And when the blood flow decreases, will that lead to ischemia? Will that lead to angina or chest pain? So what's the best treatment there? Make calcium channel what? Blocker. Why? In order for the muscle to contract, what do you need? If you block the calcium, the muscles will relax. Your vasodilation. Will that relieve the chest pain? Yes. Yo. Very simple. Right? Do you understand? Now, in MI patients, the process is irreversible. As time goes by, more and more and more plaque will deposit there, and the blood flow becomes decreased. Decreased blood flow, the blood flow becomes slower or faster. And when they're very slow, they form a blood what? Clot. And the blood clot with the fat deposit will now completely block the flow of blood. Guess what? Zero blood flow. When there's no blood flow or zero blood flow, there is no blood flow, there is no oxygen, the muscle cells will. Well. Now, how do you know that the muscle cells are dead? First, the patient will have chest pain, substernal, heavy in character, radiating to the arm, shoulder, jaw. That's cardiac pain, whether ischemia or heart attack or MI. But how would you differentiate ischemia from MI? Okay, EKG. In EKG, you would expect to find what? What's a Q wave? One. Q wave would be what? Q! How deep is your Q? How deep is your love? <laughs> How deep is your love? How deep is your Q? So in other words, you're the nurse, and you are very competent because you come from West Coast, and you pay attention to every lecture I make. Q! Yeah. Normally, Q. Q. Am I deep Q? Q. One part, two parts, three parts, two parts is below the ISO electric what line. 
equaline. What about T wave inversion? So Q wave, what is what is what kind of wave? Significant Q wave. And then what is T wave inversion? So the T wave instead of going up, it's what? Down. Go down. What about the there's mention of ST elevation, right? ST means look at the S to the T. Straight, 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 straight. ST elevation means what? Goes up. <coughs> Now, in your book, there is a difference between ST elevation and non-ST elevation, MI. Right? Did you see that? There's a diagram there. Now, what do you think is important there? To, to make, okay, there are, what is the most important test that will tell the doctor that this indeed is an MI? Serum There's something missing. Serum what? Protein. Biomarkers. Said serum marker. Mar this is a marker. <laughs> you know my dear? You see? She said serum marker. This is a marker. So you are going to look for this in the blood? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We want perfection here. So what else correct, huh? Because in the nursing board exam, are they going to put serum markers or serum biomarkers? And what is another name for serum biomarkers? Cardiac enzymes. You would expect it to be high or low? Elevated or go down? Why? Okay, very simple. If this is the heart, the myocardium cells are here, cells are here. It's a capillary here. What do, where do you find the cardiac enzymes or the serum biomarkers? But they are still found inside the heart. Cell, CPKMB, troponin, LDH, when the cell dies, what happens to the cell membrane? It's destroyed. When the cell membrane is destroyed, what happens to the biomarkers inside the cell? They go where? To the blood in the capillaries of the heart. And what happens to the blood levels? It gets elevated. In other words, the moment it's elevated, bang, am I? If it is not elevated, it's just ischemic heart disease. Do you understand? That's why in that table where you have the ST elevation and non-ST, the only sign that they would say is an MI if there is what? Elevation of the biomarkers. In the nursing board exam, I'm just telling you ahead of time. They would even ask you, when do they elevate? How many hours after the onset of chest pain? Six hours, when do they peak? And when do they start to go down? Yeah. Let's say it peaks at, let's say, 24 hours, or let's say 12 hours. Are you going to get the blood specimen after two days? No. You must be crazy. It's by this time, that you're already back to normal. Are there doctors who can be crazy and stupid? Yeah. But you are not, you're smart. Because you come from what great school? The best in the West, West Coast. So you have to memorize. Where is the peak of its OV, CPK, MB? Creatine phosphokinase, MB, not the MM, MM is muscle. MB refers to the heart muscle. And then the LDH that stands for what? Lactate dehydrogenase. Don't worry, still have a long time to go to take the nursing board exam. But I'm just telling you, this is very important. So what specimen are we going to send to the lab? Urine, stool, or blood? blood. So it's called serum. Can you imagine you answer, Stole, my God, you are really from St. Mary's School. <laughs> you understand, okay? So you see the difference? Now, so what do we give for this patient? Are we going to give a thrombolytic drug? Like streptokinase, arbokinase. What does a drug that's called thrombolytic do? Dissolve the clot. Now, anticoagulants do not dissolve the clot. They can only what? Prevent more blood clot formation. What about aspirin? It's preventing what? aggregation of the platelet, which happens to help also what, prevent the formation of the clot, which causes the obstruction. So some people take aspirin, Bayer aspirin, every day, yeah. hoping that you will not form a clot there. You understand? So in order to diagnose a patient with an MI, do we need an electrocardiogram? Yes. yes, we do. Do we need a biomarkers or cardiac enzyme study? Yes. The best in the West. You understand? Now, we can even do an angiogram. 
And then, of course, you probably read about this. You can do what? Angioplasty. You put a catheter here, and then you put what? A balloon in the coronary artery. See? You go here. Where is my? You put here. Femoral artery. Fit the catheter here. It's like a plastic tube. And then put there on the coronary artery with fat deposit. You inflate the balloon. It flattens what? The fat deposit. And put a stand to keep it open. Now, what about heart failure? Right and what? Nice. Left. So it's very important that, does anybody have a piece of paper I can erase this with? Or something like a napkin or paper, not, not the, the softer one. I'll bring it. Yeah. The bottom line, therefore, is that you have one. We got extra points in heaven. Oh, there you go. Can you bring it to me, please? The, the idea here, therefore, is this. You have to differentiate right-sided from left-sided. Now, in the signature assignment, it's very important. You have to tell me if it's right-sided or left-sided heart failure. And why? I think it's part of the question, right? Okay. It's justify your answer. Okay. So, notice here. Let's do this. Okay, one thing to remember, if the left side is failing, read there please. Left, what is the first letter of left? L. Heart failure, the answer would be what? Lung what? Pulmonary. Edema or pulmonary edema, which is lung. What's another word for edema? Congestion. Congestion. Now there are two types of failure. Backward failure, going back to the lungs, or what? Forward failure to the aorta. In backward failure, what happens? When the left side is failing, the blood will what? Will it be able to go forward to the aorta, or will it backflow to the lung? Okay, so the chief complaint would be what? Dyspnea, what is dyspnea? Shortness of breath or difficulty of breathing. This means difficult. What else, will they have orthopnea? What is orthopnea? Okay, why? When you lie down in bed in the supine, the fluid goes to the lung. It's filled with air, fluid. The air sacs cannot inflate. There is no exchange of gases. You have difficulty breathing. It's relieved by what? High back rest. Why? When you do a high back rest, what happens to the fluid? Yeah. By gravity, it goes down. Portions of the upper part of the lung will be able to reinflate, and the exchange of gases will take place. Do you understand? That's orthopnea. What about paroxysmal? Nocturnal what? What is nocturnal? Night. night. Paroxysmal. Frequent attacks of difficulty breathing at night. Why? When you lie down, there's a greater chance that you'll accumulate what? Fluid or edema or congestion. Now, you start from the nose, there's nasal what? Flare. Then what? Use of the what? Accessory muscles of what? Breathing. Will there be rounds? What's a rounds? Something like this. Because there is a lot of fluid in the lungs. What's another word for rounds? Crackles. So you need a stethoscope. Okay. In other words, it has to do with the lung. What about right sided backward failure? If it's right sided, that means it goes back where? The body. To the veins and the veins. What happened to the neck veins? The standard what? Neck, or what's another name for neck? So that's the jugular veins. What happens if it goes back to the abdominal organ? You have hepato what? Hepato, spleno what? Why? Because the blood goes back to the liver and the spleen, they become enlarged. That's the reason why they become enlarged. Why? Hepato, spleno, megaly means it's filled with blood. What about bipedal edema? The feet is swollen because there is what? Congestion and retention of water. Do you understand? Now, what's a drug of choice to patients with heart failure? Digitalis or digoxin. Why? Why digitalis? Yes. Or lanoxin? Digoxin? It's called positive 
inotropic effect. What do you mean by positive inotropic effect? I-N-O-T-R-O-P-I-C effect. It increases myocardial contractility. Increases myocardial what? Contractility, in other words, makes the muscle stronger in simple terms. It has to do with the sodium potassium pump. Second, negative chrono what? Tropic effect. What do you mean by that? It slows down. Negative, it slows down the heart rate. Instead of the heart pumping at 150 bits per minute, <laughs> you want the heart to what? 80 bits per minute to walk. Can you imagine the heart is already in failure and you want it to continuously pump at 150? You want it to lower from what? 150 to 80. Why? What's the purpose of doing that? Answer is simple. By slowing the heart rate from 150 to 80 by giving the detalis, you decrease the demand of oxygen for the myocardium. You decrease the demand for what? Or the myocardial oxygen demand decreases when you slow down the heart rate. That's very important. That will definitely come under the nursing board exams. Yes, ma'am. Okay, it makes the heart, remember it's failing. Yeah. That means the muscle is not strong, it's weak. So you want it to be stronger. Like, a, I'm not sure if I can use the word vitamin, but it's something to boost the, uh, the strength of myocardial contractility to make it stronger because it's failing. Okay. Now there are many reasons why the heart could fail. Maybe because of, uh, after an MI or what? A myocarditis or endocarditis or when you have cardiomyopathy, okay? So you want the heart muscle stronger, give this, this the drug of choice. Now, what about for the negative effect, as, as I said, you decrease the demand for oxygen by lowering the heart rate, which is good. Now, what about the pulmonary edema here? Very good. What is the best diuretic, my dear? Loop diuretic. It acts on the loop of Henley of the kidney. Yes, and what's another name for that? Lasix. This will come out in the nursing board exam. L-A-S-I-X, Lasix or furosemide. The effect is in two minutes. It's a loop diuretic because it acts on where? On the loop of Henley. What does it do? It inhibits the reabsorption of water in the loop, and the water will come out where? In the wee wee, in the urine. So if you have a lot of patient with a lot of fluid in the lungs, you get rid of the fluid, and it will come out where? In the euro bag. So they give Lasix. Yeah. Give late six, what happens? Oh, I feel better now. And you, the patient will ask you, what did you do, nurse? You saved my life, thank you so much. I owe you my life. Oh, sir, we gave you Lasix, that is furosemide. It's a loop diuretic, it acts on the loop of Henley. It prevented the re, I'm just kidding, you don't say that to the patient, but in your mind, it's a, it inhibits the reabsorption of water. Instead of the water reabsorbed by the kidney, the water gets out of the body, and then that's why you have less fluid in your lungs. Do you understand? Okay, do you understand? Okay, now, this is very important. Now, what about shock? What are the two different types of shock? You have what? Hypovolemic, like what? Blood loss, what else? Diarrhea, vomiting, what else? Stop wound with bleeding. What about uh, distributive? What are examples of distributive shock? Septic. Septic. Septic shock, when you have an infection. What else? What about anaphylactic shock? Okay. What about neurogenic spinal cord trauma shock? Yes. What about obstructive shock? What are the examples of obstructive shock? Pulmonary embolism, what else? Cardiac tamponade, what else? Hmm? Pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, very good. And dissecting aneurysm. So make sure you know, not only do you know them, but you know what they are, okay? Now hypertension. I hope you've studied what? what? What is normal blood pressure? Less than what? 120 over 80. What is pre-hypertension? 122. 139. And what is the diastolic pressure? 82. 89. So what is stage one? 142. 59. And then the diastolic would be what? 92. 
99. My God, we want perfection here, remember. What about stage two? Over, get the 150 over 100. So you don't want the numbers to overlap. Are you going to memorize that? So please believe me. Uh, this is just already a tip for you guys. When you answer the signature assignment, one of the questions there, what is states that space and have? Then enumerate the one you just said now. What is normal, what is pre-hypertension, what is stage one, what is stage two? And you justify your answer. Why did you say this is your answer? Oh, because sir, this is the answer. Pre-hypertension, stage one, stage two, patient, his blood pressure is there, so he has to be what? I don't know what your answer would be, right? You know what some people would do? Oh, the patient has stayed blank. I will not give the answer. And would even bother to explain. And they come to me and they cry. Why did you give me a grade of five out of ten or something? You know, for that question, you didn't justify your answer. Do you understand? Okay, is that clear? So, what is the drug of choice? So, depending on the kind of problems you have, right? You have two types: essential, or primary, and what? Secondary. What's the most common secondary hypertension? Renal. Renal. Because when you retain water, your blood pressure goes up. Now, are you familiar with this formula here? Cardiac output is equal to what? Heart rate. What is heart rate? It's the heart rate per minute. What about stroke volume? The amount of blood pumped by the heart per beat. What about cardiac output? The amount of blood pumped by the heart per per minute. How do you get to a gap? Very simple. 60 beats per minute. Volume over what? Per beat. So you cancel the beat, cancel the beat, what do you get? Amount of blood or volume of blood per what? That is your cardiac output. <laughs> you know your math, right? Yeah. Heart rate, beats per minute, beat on top, volume per beat, that's the definition of volu uh, stroke volume. You cancel the beat, you cancel the beat, amount of blood per minute, that is the definition of what? Where did you learn this? Not only now, but where? <laughs> Physiology. Again, please, por favor. You always go back to A and B. Now, what about blood pressure? Times what? So, if you increase your heart rate, what happens to the cardiac output? Increase. If you increase the cardiac output, what happens to the blood pressure? Increase. Why do, therefore, we give beta blockers? What, are, what do beta blockers look, do, like propranolol, atenolol, gamolol? They decrease the heart rate. When you decrease the heart rate, what do you do to the output? Decrease the output. You decrease the output, what happens to the blood pressure? There is no question that you cannot answer in pharmacology. Am I too fast? Did you understand what I was trying to say? Why do we give a beta blocker? Beta adrenergic sympathetic blocker. Sympathetic increases heart rate. Remember adrenaline, epinephrine, or epinephrine? You block that, so the heart rate will what? Go down. If you decrease the heart rate by giving this drug, and most of these drugs stands, ends with LOL, laugh out loud, right? <laughs> Propranolol. Atenolol. Gamolol. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when I was doing review for nurses, I said, don't panic, chill. You just have to be smart. You don't have to memorize all these drugs. By decreasing the heart rate, decrease cardiac output, decrease cardiac. Now what is SVR, systemic vascular resistance, right? Remember this? Resistance is equal to what? 8 NL with pi what? R to 4. So if you what? If you increase the radius, what happens to the resistance? If you decrease the resistance, what happens to the blood pressure? Increase. <laughs> the blood pressure goes down. <laughs> like here. If you vasodilate, you decrease the radius. You de what, what do you happens when you decrease the radius? Increase. I mean, you increase the radius. You decrease the resistance if you vasodilate. And then, of course, what happens? Decrease resistance, increase blood pressure. On the other hand, if it's vasoconstrict or your fat deposit, what happens? 
the opposite. If you have a fat deposit, radius will go down, resistance goes up, goes up, and then that's the reason why people with a lot of fat deposit, why, why do you think their blood pressure goes up? There's an increase in what? Left ventricular what? After load. Because it's harder for the heart to pump blood to the aorta, right? Left ventricular after load will be affected. Is that clear? We recover everything. I think shock, heart, MI, heart failure. And of course, what? I'm always out of frame. I'm not used to this. And then of course, about hypertension. Uh, what kind of diet do we give this patient? High, high salt, low salt? Why? Because wherever salt is or sodium is, water will. The more water you have, your blood pressure what? Very simple. Why? The more blood you have, the more blood going here, the more blood going out. The more blood going out, the more what? High cardiac output. High cardiac output, the more blood goes up, pressure goes up. So do we give diuretic like Lasix as a form of treatment for hypertension? Are we going to have fluid restriction? Yes. And sodium restriction? Yes. Diet modification? Yes. Exercise? Yes. Should I exercise? Yep. Okay? That's it? What else did I not? Is there anything in the study guide that they did not cover? No. No, no, yeah. This, this guy. Okay, so I talk about infarction, I mentioned yeah, that, right? Yeah, yeah, like Q wave, right? Q wave. Yeah. So Q wave is significant, right? So some would say that the T wave and ST would probably just be ischemia, but the Q wave really is one of them, and in this case, maybe T wave. In your book, I said they mentioned T wave. But what's really important is what? The cardiac enzymes, okay? Is there anything else? The RAAS. Uh, of course. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Where is the renin produced? When is it released? When your blood volume is down and your blood pressure is down, renin is released by the kidney, and what does renin do? Hmm? What? Okay, remember? Renin is coming from the kidney, right? So renin will convert what? Angiotensinogen. So angiotensin 1. Now what will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2? Ace. 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 And where is Ace coming from? The lung. the lung. I like this class. They're very smart. And the lung produces the Ace or angiotensin converting enzyme from angiotensin 1 to 2. So angiotensin 2 is produced. Now going back to the angiotensinogen, where is it coming from? The liver. I like this class again. Very smart. So renin from the kidney, angiotensinogen from the liver, and then, of course, renin from the kidney will convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then the lung produces the ACE, converting 1 to 2, and you end up with angiotensin 2. Now, what does angiotensin do? Stimulates what? Vasoconstriction. And if you vasoconstrict, radius goes down, resistance goes up. And guess what happens, right? The effect. Why, why, why do you want your blood pressure to go up? Because renin will only be released if your blood pressure drops, like when you have hypovolemia. You understand? And what else, aside from vasoconstriction, the, it will also cause the aldosterone to release what? Ah, the <laughs> adrenal, what? adrenal cortex to release what? Aldosterone. Which is the mineralocorticoid, which promotes water and sodium retention. More water, more the blood pressure goes up, which can help problems with hypovolemic shock, right? You understand? Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a five-minute break. Yeah. We'll have.